It's a great honour and pleasure for me to be here. And I tell you what, I said I'm only speaking first. I'm not speaking after David Attenborough and Hilary Sperling. I said it's first or not at all. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, delight to be here. John loved this museum, and so do I. Uh, you are standing on uh, a mosaic floor, a Roman mosaic floor, of the type that John helped Mortimer Wheeler to excavate in St Albans when he was eight. He had that sort of life. That's how he started out. He uh, was the sort of person who was beyond education. He tried numerous schools briefly uh, before parting uh, ways with them. He said he wasn't expelled. He left before he was expelled. Uh, and he, uh, his mother then, in some despair, um, packed him off to her sister and her sister's husband, who was a painter in Dorset. And they lived in an ancient uh, cob and thatch cottage on Cranbourne Chase. And John really found himself there. He loved being in a painter's house. He came from a family of mu musicians, but it was great for him to be amongst his own kind, painters. He loved Dorset, he loved the landscapes, he loved the archaeology of Dorset, he loved the mythology, he loved the legends of Dorset. And this great secret remote place was very much his own. He had a lifetime uh, as a nomad, but really Dorset was his, the first step on this lifetime journey, which of course ultimately got him to Greece, but it all started in Dorset. He was lucky all his life, and one of his great strokes of good fortune was ending up in this cottage, which for many people would be, would be the back of beyond, but it just happened to be a walk away, a short walk away, from this Aladdin's cave that was the Pitt Rivers Museum. And John, who couldn't bear education, uh, was let loose in the Pitt Rivers Museum, which had treasures from all over the world, all periods, all places. And John just looked at these things and taught himself, really. Uh, and uh, the objects there had a great impact on his later life as a traveller and as an artist. And we've borrowed uh, some wonderful things from the Sainsbury Centre in Norwich that used to be in the Pitt Rivers Museum to show you the sort of things that influence his, John's later life. We also have a, a, a show within, within the show of works by John's uncle, Cecil Waller. And then all around it is this great story of John Craxton, who was one of the great European artists of the 20th century. And he was one of the European art's greatest secrets as well. And he partly insisted on that. Uh, he hated the art world, uh, and he didn't want to sell his pictures. He wanted to buy them all back if he could. And so um, what we have here today is a show that's very much Dorset-based. It shows how John set out in life. And many of these things, the, ma the majority of these pictures, have never been seen before. And we've restored them, especially for this show. And we hope you enjoy them. We're sure you will enjoy them. It's a wonderful-looking exhibition. I don't feel I've created it at all. I feel I've just watched it taking shape, really. Uh, now, that was it from me, because I'm, I'm giving a lecture tomorrow so at half past seven here, so I'll talk at greater length then. Uh, John was a wonderful person, and as measured by the company he kept, he had terrific friends, two of which are here this evening, and we're, I'm delighted they are. They also feature in a film uh, that's looped into the show uh, that was on uh, the Culture Show, BBC Two, three years ago, uh, presented by David Attenborough, and there's an interview with Hilary Sperling. Hilary Sperling, who says she doesn't write about art, although she got the Whitbread Prize for her biography of Matisse. So uh, I think that is the best artist biography ever. So I'm thrilled to have her here this evening. Uh, but we're going to start with uh, some words from David Attenborough, who needs no introduction, uh, except that in this instance, he, um, he said he normally comes to this museum to see the dinosaur uh, relics. But... He, uh, David was one of John's great friends and went to see him in Greece and they had a great friendship for 25 years? Yep, 25 years. I only managed 10, so J David was up there much longer than me. So with, without further ado, I'll hand over to Sir David Attenborough. Thank you very much. This is a very important exhibition. It's a remarkable exhibition. And I congratulate this museum on having, as it were, secured it. Let me explain. When you get there, you will see that there are, in fact, it's an exhibition of two separate worlds. You might almost think it's two separate painters. 
The first one that you will see was, was painted by John, the pictures were painted by John when he was a young man. And when during the war and before the war, when he felt imprisoned in this country, he yearned for the sun. And the pictures that he produced there are extraordinary. They're very introverted. People, art critics, thought that it was, had overtones of Samuel Palmer, the, of the young man in a, in a, a, a shepherd, um, worrying about the landscape, being part of the landscape. These were painted in this country, county and farther west. And it gave him, the art critics of the time, immediately after the war, gave him the title. They said he was uh, a, a, a neo-Georgian neo painter. He was uh, like Samuel Palmer. He didn't care for labels. John didn't care for labels. He didn't like labels of any kind. And he didn't like being called that. Neo-romantic. He was not a neo-romantic, he said. He was, in fact, but he denied it. But what he did, as soon as the war was over, he got to Greece. He got to the sunshine. And his art changes. And you see astonishing pictures, full vibrancy and light and colour, which are very much John. And they become more and more characteristic of him. More and more original. One of his inventions, it makes it sound rather crude, but one of his inventions was to use line. He believed line was important in pictures. And he used line, coloured line, to give a vibrancy and uh, excitement to a picture when you see, when you get in there. Well, I first met him because I saw one of his pictures, one of these new pictures, uh, in a very small London art gallery. And I couldn't find out who this man was, where he was, and so on. And eventually I got to know uh, the owner of the gallery, and he revealed that John was in Greece. And when was he going to come over? He wasn't going to come over. He didn't care about the London art scene. He had got to Greece, and he had found the place where he felt he could really be alive where he could really paint. And he painted. He had a scorn for the art world of the cliques of the West End fashionable London. But he had to earn a living, uh, though at the time uh, his gallery discovered that he really hadn't got any money at all. And the gallery took him in hand and said, look, if you want to live, even if you want to pay what it costs to, learn, to live down in Crete, in Crete You've still got to sell a few. So John reluctantly, reluctantly allowed a few to come. And I bought one or two. And then eventually John arrived for a visit. I got to know him. And he became one of our great friends. He was marvellous company. Generous, witty, funny, modest. A joy to be with. The only problem was that he wouldn't let his pictures go. I used to buy, would buy a picture, and John would say, yes, it's, it's just fine, but that bit there at the bottom is not right, so I, I'd like to have it back, please. <laughs> and, uh, okay, so he took it back, and he started painting. It took me days, months, weeks, years to get the damn thing back before he'd finished with it. And he would never finish any of his pictures. But when you see there, you will see a perfection. They have a, a meaning and a vibrancy and an excitement that I find unparalleled. Well, John had died some years ago now. Uh, and he had uh, the family home, it was in North London, in Kittapur Avenue. And Ian, who just heard, had the job of looking in the uh, Kittapur Avenue vaults and finding pictures that have never been exhibited, as far as I know, have never been seen. I certainly haven't seen any. There are pictures also in there that have come from private homes, which Ian has discovered. So what you're seeing, and this is why it's important, what you are seeing is a remarkable artist, effectively first show, 
with pictures from across his career which reveal what an astonishing artist he is. An artist who is just coming into his own. And it's marvellous that Dorchester should give them this remarkable show. A lot of the pictures, first time seen in public. Thanks and congratulations to the museum. And here's Hilary. Well, I'm just going to say very briefly the same thing. John Craxon was a painter who loved light and colour, as you will see. He, this exhibition begins with a lot of moody little pictures of a, of a dismal and unhappy young man trying to, well, basically saying, I'm not here. And the background is the bleak and grim and grey background of England in the war. And as soon as he could, he left and uh, got to Greece and became, I agree with David completely, an extraordinary painter. And you will see him, you will see these paintings, you can make up your own minds, I hope you agree. Uh, so of course Greece was wonderful for him as a painter. But in another sense Greece was an absolute disaster for him as a painter because when he was in Greece and sending few pictures back and so forth. He became dimmer and dimmer in the memories in England that still remembered him. He'd been a young man of great promise. He went to Greece. This is the story that I heard when I grew up. And I actually met Craxton quite often at parties and a marvelous, a marvelous character he was. But his paintings seemed to me very dull, very repetitive. And the reason is it was the same old handful. The ones I particularly remember are great big black and white drawings and I saw them endlessly all trotted out. As a, and I thought, well, my goodness. Uh, the problem was that he'd been largely forgotten by his own generation because they hadn't been there to see what he was really doing. And it was very different from what they were doing in any case. And the next generation really didn't know him. As I say, people like me... There was no reason why we should particularly respect Craxton as a, as a painter. And uh, that was it. He was a kind of uh, has-been. I think this was a very widely accepted view. I liked him as a man, and I didn't think too much. And I, I'm just... I'm, because I was young and ignorant, but then I think most people were ignorant in those days. And um, so it went on. And there are, I think the reason is, actually, of course, that he went to Greece... So he, he was forgotten, more or less obliterated over here. And in Greece, of course, he felt completely at home, made himself at home, seemed more Greek than the Greeks. Uh, wore, as I understand it, a, a, a mountain shepherd kit, which actually most people were not doing in the town where he lived. He stood out a mile. You couldn't miss him. He, he, but though he was in Greece, he was not of it, certainly He's not a Greek painter, as Greek painters understand that uh, calling. So, and I've seen this happen many times, actually, in my now rather long life, that a painter who leaves his native land, having begun as a painter there, and makes a career elsewhere, isn't really, um, on the whole, esteemed greatly where he came from, because he gets forgotten, and doesn't seem to have progressed very much, because they don't know what he did. And he's not very much uh, esteemed either where he went, because he's not one of ours, you know. Well, yes, I mean, I've seen it happen to an American in Italy. I've seen it happen to a Frenchman in England. And they are both exceedingly good painters and pretty much forgotten. And that is not going to happen to Craxton. And that is because, I think, he had the great f f good fortune to be rediscovered and shown after his death, as David Attenborough so eloquently explained, in a, a richness and a fullness that his contemporaries never had the chance to see. And that he owes to Ian Collins, who is a man that never lets go. He's a terrier. He cannot be, he cannot be removed from his prey. And he has honed in on Craxton for many years. And I think Craxton is very lucky to have him, posthumously speaking, and from the point of view of his reputation as a painter. And we are also very lucky, because we are the ones that reap the fruits, which is what you're all about to do, and I wish you luck. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Anyway, it's a great show, and it's a, I echo David's thanks to the Dorset Museum, who really saw a chance and took it. And let's hope the rest of the uh, art world will follow where Dorchester leads today.
thank you very much. Uh, just uh, before we let you uh, go and have a look at the show, and I know you're all chomping at the bit now, you couldn't do an exhibition like this without the help and support of a great many people. So I do need to make a few thank yous on behalf of the Board of Trustees of the Dorset Natural History and Archaeological Society and the Dorset County Museum. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Richard Riley and the Craxton Estate who have generously lent to the exhibition and without whom it wouldn't have been possible. And also John's cousin, Elizabeth Waller, who's here this evening, who, without whose support we couldn't have done the exhibition either. We're also indebted to all the private lenders and the public lenders, including Bristol City Art Gallery. I, my, one of the things I've really enjoyed today is seeing the curator of Bristol City Art Gallery effectively being told off by Sir David Hammond <laughs> uh, in the film at the bottom end for keeping this masterpiece in the basement, and it's our pleasure to have it here in this show. Uh, we wanted to thank the, the Britain Peers Foundation, Cam, Camden Borough Council, Pallant House, the Sainsbury Centre, and Tate for their support, all of whom have lent to the exhibition most generously. I'd like you all to help me thank, in the traditional way, our special guests this evening, Sir David Attenborough and Hilary Spurling. <laughs> and I'd like to thank them both for their support of the Dorset County Museum and their passion uh, for John Craxton, which I think has been evident both in their support for the exhibition and their words this evening. Uh, I must, of course, thank all the, the team of staff and volunteers here at the museum who have worked tremendously hard to make this exhibition a success. Ian is a hard taskmaster, uh, but I, don't, I like to think we haven't disappointed him. Every loan he's wanted, we've got. Uh, <laughs> I may have used up a lot of favours in the process, but it's been well worth it. Uh, but I, on that note, I would like to thank Ian last, but of course not least, who has curated a marvellous show. Uh, it's the culmination of a project that, for me, began four years ago in this very room when uh, Ian came here and gave a talk about, about John. And I think all of us at the uh, DNHS and the museum are very much uh, in his debt. So thank you very much indeed, Ian. I was, I was going to say, really, Sir David should declare the show open, but I, <laughs> shall I, as I'm up here? So do go in and enjoy the, enjoy the exhibition. I think it's a really wonderful, wonderful work, and I hope you all enjoy it, and I hope that all of Dorset and this part of England enjoys it. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>